Good evening, colleagues. Welcome to the meeting of the Council. Please be seated. I, I am required to inform you that this meeting is being recorded. If any member of the public or press would like more information about this, or if they intend to record proceedings themselves, please contact Strategy and Democracy Services, who will be more than happy to advise. Any member who wishes to speak on any of the agenda items should use the microphone available. Colleagues, as you know, Jim Purcell, affectionately known as Jared Jim, passed away on Friday the 9th of February. Jim was a Second World War veteran, a Great North Run legend and a charity champ, raising hundreds of thousands of pounds for local charities. The flags on the town hall in his hometown of Jarrow will be flown at half-mast as a, a mask as a, a mark of respect. I have sent condolences on behalf of the Council to his family. Can I ask members to stand for a minute's silence in memory of the We are informed members that Margaret Adams is stepping down from her role as Chair of HealthNet at the end of March. Her involvement has been in a voluntary capacity and she has worked tirelessly for individuals and the community. On behalf of the Council, I thank Margaret for her dedication and achievements over the years and wish her well for the future. <coughs> Following decisions made by Sunderland and South Tyneside CCG governing bodies yesterday, I would like to invite uh, Councillor Reedy, Reedy um, to update Council on what the next steps are with regard to the Joint Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee response. And therefore, on the decision made by the government bodies of Southern and South Townside CCGs concerning changes to the Turkey, gynecology, emergency pediatric and stroke services, South Townside and Southern Joint Health Scrutiny Committee will be considering its response at a special range meeting on March the 1st. I believe that's in this town hall as well. Now that these decisions have been made, one of the options now open to the committee is to refer any or all of the decisions made on these services to the Secretary of State for Health. We will ensure that members and the people of South Townside are informed of the outcome of these discussions. And make sure that everybody knows about what happens next. Thanks very much. Thanks, Councillor Brady. The first item of business is declarations of interest. No declarations have been received. Does anyone now wish to verbally make any declarations before we move on to the next business? Right. The next item of business is the minutes of the meeting of the Council on the 18th of January 2018. 
or they accept it as a true record. The next business is to consider a report of the Head of Finance recommending approval of Shaping Our Future, the Council's medium-term financial plan draft budget recommendations. This is an important decision and I want members to be clear about how I will, how I will conduct the debate. The Constitution requires that anyone wishing to move an amendment to budget proposals must give two working days advance notice to the Chief Executive. No notice has been given of any amendments. I will ask Councillor Ed Markham to move the motion. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, the, the budget I present today has been made in one of the most unstable political and economic environments experienced in recent times. We not only have a government consumed by the vortex of Brexit, but it is also coupled to the fact that the government's lack of a majority in the House of Commons impedes its ability to develop and deliver very important domestic issues. But one thing hasn't changed. That is the Conservative government's obsession with austerity, an economic policy which this country has been subjected to for over a decade. An unnecessary policy, a failed policy that has damaged our economy and continues to destroy our public infrastructure, a policy which is hurting the most vulnerable in our society. Jeremy Corbyn was right when he said, austerity is unleashing chaos around the country. Austerity in the public sector is set to continue. This was the policy choice of George Osborne in 2010, and it is a policy choice now. As the economist William Keegan noted, underlying it, it all is the Conservative Party of Second with shrinking the size of the state and minimising the so-called tax burden, a burden which helps to ensure now we have decent hospitals, schools and infrastructure generally. Nowhere is the Conservative government's reckless embrace of austerity more evident than in local government. As the leader argued in the Guardian put it, the bizarre hard-heartedness of austerity sees councils with the highest levels of deprivation facing the biggest cuts to the most vulnerable, whether that is children's services of social care spending. One cannot help but feel a certain shrug frown that the first local authority to go bust under austerity, North Hampshire County Council, is in a true blue Conservative Wood Council in the heart of Middle England. But I may, this Labour Council has no intentions of having a Section 114 notice placed upon it. We pay our bills. Nevertheless, we in South Tyneside have felt the reckless embrace of austerity. We have been faced with spending cuts that are unprecedented and unjustifiable. Since 2010, we have lost 6% of our government funding with no real prospects from this government of any additional resources. Members will only be too clearly aware that this has meant that over the last eight years, this council has had to deliver £145 million pounds worth of efficiencies with a further £11 million pounds in 2018-19. There seems to be no respite from this madness. Further funding reductions are expected in future years with the Council's net revenue budget projected, projected to be 37% less in cash terms in 2019-20 compared to 2010-11. This means another £44 million worth of savings over the next five years. 
And the local government finance settlement contained no new money from central government. It was extremely disappointing that the government has chosen yet again not to address the continuing funding gap for children's and adult services. And we continue to face funding pressures in these services. An injection of new money from central government is the only way to guarantee protection of vital <coughs> services which care for the older and disabled people, protect children and support families. <coughs> the national economy is heading into uncharted waters. The 2017 autumn budget was accompanied by the announcement of a significant reduction in the rate of growth in the economy and by confirmed rises in the rate of inflation. Both developments have the potential to impact on local government finances in the medium term. And it is too early to identify the direct implications for local governments of the UK's departure from the European Union, such as the overall economic impact of Brexit and, and its implications for public spending. There can be no doubt that we have a challenge regarding our finances and the provision of services. However, this Labour Council has faced up to the challenge. We have been pragmatic, innovative, forged new partnerships and made difficult choices. The Council is making every pound count and is making a very challenging financial decision work for itself. It is evidently demonstrating that it is punching above its weight. Those are not my words, but those from the independent inspectors that undertook the autumn 2017 LGA corporate peer challenge. We are therefore able to develop our strategic and financial plans from a very strong base. We have learned to drive an environment that encourages innovation and change as the norm so that we can overcome these challenges. However, there are some longer term strategic issues which are likely to impact on council finances over the next few years. For example, the government's fair funding review will set new funding baselines for every local authority. This will run parallel with the introduction of the 75% business rate retention scheme in 2010-2021. We have adopted an overall financial strategy which commits us to a number of guiding principles. These are spending should be allocated to our priorities, council tax should be affordable for our residents, financial planning should be based upon long-term horizons, Value for money is achieved from all our spending and members make real choices about investments. Consequently, the budget in front of you today is in keeping with our financial strategy and continues with the policy and main approaches to the efficiencies that we have to make, focusing on delivering greater value for money, delivering services, in new and innovative ways and income generation. We are committed to reach the Council's carbon footprint and working in partnership with the community and the voluntary sector to deliver services. The books are balanced to meet budget demands, but pressure on adult and social care <coughs> continue to place further strain on our budgets. There is a recommendation for a council tax increase of 4.95%. We are asking residents to pay a little, little extra to help mitigate the effects of grant reductions to the borough. Uh -huh. Of this increase, 2% is the government levy for the adult social care. The 4.95% council tax is a total tax increase. The cuts are fighting deeper and deeper every year affecting the essential services we provide. 
The government is treating some things very harshly and unfairly. Hard pressed areas like ours are facing massive puts, while some well heeled Tory councils in the south have seen their grants actually increase. Despite the immense budget pressures, this Labour Council has not closed any community centres and not closed any libraries. However, we have to recognise that the Council is unable to do everything and provide everything. The slashing of government funding since 2010 has determined that we simply cannot afford to subsidise services to the same extent as we have done historically. The borough has an array of assets in the community, assets such as community groups and physical assets. These have been increasingly harnessed to support the communities, service delivery and resilience. The transfer of community assets such as the community facilities and branch libraries could not be made possible without the support of the people of South Tyneside who have been really supportive and have come forward to work with us to protect these services and to develop new service models. We should not underestimate the wealth of support that we have received. I must stress that it is only by working together as a partnership that we will be able to reduce the negative impact that these unprecedented cuts are having on our communities. We are a council that cares. We place at the heart of all that we do. We place people. And together, we can take action to do what is right for some time side with the resources that we have available. We protect those who are vulnerable. Children need to be saved. Regret regrettably, we have too many in the borough which requires the children's or the children's services, protection from abuse and neglect. We take our corporate parenting responsibilities very seriously, giving support to vulnerable children and young people from our highly conventional social care services. These responsibilities extend to care leavers who often face challenges as they make their way to adult life. Part of the council's budget involves setting a level of council tax, as members will know. I would like to remind members in this chamber that last year, <coughs> the council decided that care leavers up to the age of 25 would be exempt from council tax. This will hopefully provide financial support to care leavers. I can announce today <coughs> that this budget allows for the policy to continue into 2018-19 and overall resources have been tamed for our children's social care services. Vulnerable adults also need to be saved and supported. However, members are aware that there is a crisis in the health and care sector. Demand is increasing, costs, costs are increasing, but funding is reducing. The situation is very stressed for all council budgets. There is no doubt that the key to reduce, reducing these escalating costs and increasing demand lies in early intervention. That is why we recognise the need to continually evolve our social care strategy and approach. Our improvement programme has helped us to develop our ability to identify early need, support independence and improve outcome for residents. We are proposing an increase in the adult social care budget of £3.1 million, but because of the adequate funding from the government, we have to increase the adult social care levy element of the council tax in an attempt to try and bridge the funding gap. Recent solutions to the crisis facing adult social care have been likened to using a sticking plaster to cover a much more serious wound. An article by the LGA commented that short-term and incremental action only creates deeper, more symptomatic 
problems. The consequences of which go further across the wire care and health system. Sticking plaster are not the answer. The government must urgently address the crisis in adult social care, which is woefully underfunded, with national solutions. We remain committed to improving the health and well-being of our residents, with early mortality from heart disease reduced by 50%, unplanned teenage pregnancies reduced by 50%, and a 20% reduction in smoking, which ranks us in the top 10 performing authorities in England in this priority area. The Council recognises that we still have a long way to go in tackling alcohol misuse and cancer related deaths. Universal Credit represents the latest attack from the Conservative government on the vulnerable. The Institute for Policy Research and the Child Action Company Group estimate that universal credit is going to put another 200,000 children into poverty. I'm pleased to announce today, Madam Mayor, in this budget that this budget protects resources available to support those who will be affected by the pernicious policies of the present Conservative government. We have a dedicated welfare reform team, we financially support partners such as Citizens Advice, and we will also continue with the Council's discretionary hardship fund of £189,000. We support the local economy. We remain, we remain unrelenting and our desire to create a new economic future for the borough. Our investment in town centres continues to pace across South Tyneside. There are physical improvements that are changing town centres and neighbourhoods for the better. The council's investment at Heaven Circle is now attracting private sector investment. The £3 million general hope transformation will be complete this year. And the word, the National Centre for the Written Word, continues to win national and international accolades. We have invested in roads and footpaths, beaches and the sea front. Phase 2 of the South Shields 365 is underway. And we are attracting inward investment. We secure £42.5 million of regional funding for the International Advanced Manufacturing Park. Work on this site starts this year and 5,000 jobs will be created when I am fully operational. Progress is also underway in the development of the whole water of the site site, which will attract further inward investment and create more jobs for the people in South Tyneside. Employers also need a skilled workforce. We recognise this and we want business to be able to recruit and retain the skills that they need to grow and thrive. The Council will cons consequently continue to invest over £4 million per year in the skills agenda through commissioning training and apprenticeships. We will also seek to strengthen our skills offerings for all age groups to support regeneration through working with businesses and higher, higher and local and further education providers. We also recognise the importance of digitalisation agenda. Increasing digitalisation is another way in which the Council has been able to manage demand. And we work closely with BT South Tyneside on this. Our working with BT South Tyneside has given us the confidence to better tackle new challenges such as the digital agenda, which is hugely important to us in how residents expect to interact with the council and also how we effectively manage and use information within services, across services and with partners. We will continue implementing new dynamic digital technology to, be, to meet residents' expectations and to make us even more efficient. Therefore, our capital investment programme recognises the importance 
of continuing investment in this area, including our award-winning website. But I mean, working with BT some time side with whom we have worked for almost 20 years has given us other benefits also. The partnership of service delivery will come to an end in October, but we can look back with pride on what has been achieved. This includes investment and transformation of key services, regeneration of heart and keys, and more jobs in the borough. We are a listening council. We consult with residents and partners to help shape the policies of the council and ensure that we focus upon priorities in the borough. We know that a key issue for the public is the condition of highways and footpaths. I can announce today that we are continuing to invest £2 million in the Flax and Flexible programme. We are investing almost £2 million in our Highways and Tears programme in 2018-19. Once again, the community area forums will have £1.4 million at their disposal. Housing is important to us. The provision of good, affordable housing is a high priority for this council. £243 million has been invested and improved over 7.5 homes across the borough to reach decent home standard, which was delivered by our housing company, South Times Air Homes. 2,341 new homes have been built in the borough since 2010. South Times Air Housing Ventures Trust is surpassing all expectations in developing social housing and developing high quality affordable homes with 300 homes built and another 80 homes to be built this year. <coughs> so I can announce today that we have an extensive housing capital program of £15.3 million in the coming year. We in the council are moving in the right direction. We're moving forward. We continue to endeavour to be exceptionally and an outstanding place to live, invest and bring up families. Some of our achievements this year have been the children's services rated as good by offset inspectors, let this one improve first completed, £4.2 million funding secured from local street park restorations and improvements. Madam Mayor, setting the council's budget in a climate of uncertainty against the black backdrop of reducing budgets and rising expectations has never been more difficult. Nevertheless, local government still has a role to play in the life of the community and the seeks to serve. In her resignation letter, Councillor Claire Cobra, the leader of Harrington Council, the Harrington Gate Council is there. While local government does not enjoy the esteem of its national counterpart, that is where change truly happens. I agree with those sentiments. I firmly believe that South Tyneside Council and Labour Council is making a difference for the better to the borough and to the lives of the people we represent. We are a competent, confident and an ambitious borough. In the face of austerity, this Labour Council will use every tool available at its disposal to ensure that South Tanksay continues to thrive. I move the budget recommendation set up in paragraph 23, 29 of the report. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Is that seconded? <coughs> Is it seconded? Thank you. Uh, now we move to the debate on the main motion. Do any members wish to ask questions or speak? I will ask the leader to close the debate on the main motion 
approving the recommendations made by Cabinet in the report. Well, thank you, um, uh, Madam Mayor. We've got a long agenda this afternoon, and given the fact that the leader normally responds to the opposition proposals, and the opposition is not here, uh, I'll, I'll only speak very briefly. I want to first of all congratulate Councillor Ed Malcolm on his budget presentation this afternoon and to thank Councillor Malcolm and all my colleagues in the Cabinet for the work that they have done uh, during the course of the previous year, working with officers both formally every Friday morning and informally in their departments, uh, talking to officers on a regular basis about new innovations, about how do we achieve efficiency savings and how we can make the South Tyneside pound go further. It's a continuous task. Um, the budget this afternoon, if it's approved, we will already begin the preparations for next year's budget, 2019-2020, uh, next, next week. So it is a continuous program. But I do want to just um, refer to the fact that local government nationally, in terms of finance, is now reaching a crisis point. When you now have councils, county councils, declaring that they are literally unable to pay the bills, that they are, are now getting themselves into the situation of declaring uh, Section 114, which is actually extremely serious because it means a council cannot authorise any expenditure without the express approval of the district auditor, then it begins to demonstrate the seriousness of the situation. And the government has got to take responsibility for that because, as Councillor Martin said, austerity is a choice. The austerity doesn't have to happen. It is an ideological decision by the previous coalition government and now this government to make local government bear the brunt of their austerity measures. It is an ideological choice that can be changed. Now, until we get a new Labour government, which is pledged to work with local communities and with local councils, then we will need to continue to lobby and to try and influence ministers and civil servants in London about the reckless nature of some of their policies. Because I think we have to appreciate that everything local government does, we do it understand. We are responsible for decisions, by implementing local decisions, under government guidelines. It's government that set the targets. It's government that tells local councils how they expect adult social care, children's services, the um, quality of the social infrastructure such as the roads and the library service and so forth. It's national government under parliamentary statute that tells local government what they expect to do. And you now have a situation, not just in North Hampshire, but right across local government in this country, where local authorities are not going to be able to fulfil their legal obligations. Unless the government not just provides a new financial settlement, that isn't the answer. National government need to provide a new funding formula for local government. A formula that ensures that we have adequate resources to fund adult social care. Where in this authority we are expecting a huge increase by 2030 in our plus 60 population, with all of the rising costs and the health issues associated with that. Unless we have the proper resources for education and the protection of our most vulnerable adults, the national government has got to provide that right funding formula. Finally, Mr. Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor, I remember the days standing in this chamber when Jim Capstick, the late Jim Capstick, as a lone progressive would stand in this chamber and propose an alternative budget. And Jim would stand there and he would be listened to in respectful silence and while he called the authority the ruling Labour group, where he asked for justification for an increase in the council tax, where he would ask probing questions about service provision, and yes, he would propose an alternative budget. The guy didn't get a second, but he proposed his alternative budget. I can't help feeling, Mr. Air, Madam Mayor, that those voters in this borough who are not Labour supporters have been shortchanged by the opposition on South Tyneside, and the voters of the B board have been terribly let down by the silent man 
who has refused to attend today in order to provide challenge to this authority when you had someone like Jim Capsick as a lone progressive would try to hold this authority to account. I'm sure that matter will be readdressed by the votes of the people on May the 3rd. Finally, Madam Mayor, this Labour authority is extremely proud of this budget, which has been uh, delivered in extreme, uh, in, in an extreme environment of austerity. We will take our case to the electorate on May the 3rd about the ambitions that we have for South Tyneside, about our commitment to job creation, about our commitment to transforming our towns and villages and our determination to work with local communities to protect their local services. And I'm absolutely confident that if we speak and communicate and work with our local residents, then they will reward us at the ballot box on May the 3rd. Thank you very much. Thank you. Legislation now requires that a name vote is taken on certain decisions relating to the settling of the budget. I will therefore ask the Head of Legal Services to conduct the vote. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the main vote will be conducted by me reading out the name of each councillor in turn, and if you could indicate whether you are voting for or against the motion, or uh, abstaining. Uh, so, can I ask Councillor Amar? For. Councillor Anglin? For. Councillor Atkinson? For. Councillor Bell? For. Councillor Boyack? For. Councillor Brady? For. Councillor Clare? Councillor Cunningham? For. Councillor Dick? For. Councillor Dix? Councillor Dixon? For. Councillor Donson? Councillor Duncan, Councillor Ellison, four. Councillor Flynn, four. Councillor Foreman, four. Councillor Gibson, four. Councillor Hay, four. Councillor Hetherington, four. Councillor Hobson, Councillor Hughes, Councillor Huntley, four. Councillor Keegan, Councillor Kerr, four. Councillor Kagar, Councillor Lees, Councillor E. Malcolm, four. Councillor I. Malcolm, four. Councillor K. Maxwell, four. Councillor N. Maxwell, four. Councillor N. E. Maxwell, Councillor McKay, four. Councillor McHugh, four. Councillor McMillan, four. Councillor Melling, four. Councillor Peacock. Four. Councillor Perry. Councillor Porthouse. Four. Councillor Proudlock. Four. Councillor Punchman. Four. Councillor Purvis. Four. Councillor Sewell. Four. Councillor A. Smith. Four. Councillor M. Smith. Four. Councillor K. Stevenson. Four. Councillor S. Stevenson. Four. Councillor Strike. Four. Councillor Townsley. Councillor Trainer. Four. Councillor A. Walsh. Four. Councillor M. Walsh. Four. Councillor Welsh. Four. Councillor West. Four. Councillor Wood. Four. Four. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Perry. Four. It's you know. <coughs> right. Uh -huh. Right. Uh -huh. Uh, it is a unanimous vote for, for, the for the motion. Thank you. The next business is Mayor's Communications. There are no Mayor's Communications to report on this occasion. <coughs> the next item to consider is a report of the Chief Executive on the appointment of an independent chair of the Standards Committee. A copy of the report was sent out to members under separate cover. I will ask <coughs> Councillor Boyack to formally move the report. Councillor Boyack. This report, Madam Mayor, recommends the appointment of Mr Graham Wright 
as the independent chair of the Council Standards Committee. As mentioned in the report, Mr Wright was interviewed by a panel of members which I chaired on Monday this week. Mr Wright demonstrated wide experience of work in the university sector as an academic and a senior manager. The panel felt he showed an even-handed approach to the problem solving that were of great importance in this position. Mr. M Mr. Wright is also a resident of the borough and serves as chair of the Customs House Trust. The appointment is intended to run from today until May 2022 at the annual meeting of the Council. At that point, the Council, the Council will have the option to offer an extension of an appointment up to a further four years. The panel recommends that Mr. Graham Wright is appointed to the position of chair of the Standards Committee with immediate effect. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Right. Is that seconded? Seconded. seconded? Are there any questions on, or does any member to speak to the report? All right. Is the motion agreed? <coughs> the next business is to consider a report of the Head of Pensions seeking approval of the Treasury Management Strategy 2018 to 2019. I will ask Councillor Ed Malcolm to formally move the report. Councillor Ed Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. This report is prepared to comply with local government legislation, the Charter of the Institute of Public Finance, Code of Practice, and guidance from the Department for Communities and Local Government. It outlines the Council's Treasury Management Strategy for 2018 19 in two main areas. Part one concerns the top 10 side consolidated loans fund and covers the council borrowing and potential in treasury indicators. The indicators have been used to set the framework within the treasury management strategy, which has been developed. Part two concerns the investment strategy and covers the investment of the capital, <coughs> pension fund, and top 10 side home tax managers. The strategy has been com com uh, compli com complied alongside compared well alongside the council's budget. It is based on interest rate forecasts available at the time of writing and outlines factors that may affect decision making in 2018-19. Therefore I'm recommending council to approve the Treasury Management Strategy for 2018-19. Right. Is that seconded? Seconded. Right. Are there any questions or does any member wish to speak to the report? Is the motion agreed? Agreed. Thank you. The next business is to consider a report of the Operations Director on supporting the Armed Forces Community Covenant in South Tyneside. I will ask Councillor Ed Malcolm to formally move the report. Councillor Ed Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. But I mean, members will, will know that we have always supported uh, Remembrance Sunday and any other events that the uh, armed forces have asked us to, uh, to organise. However, the Council signed an armed, for, the armed forces covenant in 2011. And this is a, 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 a public commitment to ensure that those who serve or have served in the armed forces and their families are treated and supported fairly when they return back to civilian, civilian life. So organising the likes of Remembrance Sunday events and Anzac Day events, that's something that we do as an authority. That's wired into our DNA. However, the Covenant asks us to go further. And I'd like to please report that I think that this, uh, this council has went above and beyond what we need, what has been required of us as a covenant. So this report gives details of work that we've been undertaking over the past 18 months to support the armed forces community. And I might be from the full report, I'm trying to highlight some of the, some of the, some of the, uh, the, the uh, things that uh, the, that we've been doing as a as a um, as the armed forces forum. 
You can see from the report that it's been a very busy time for, for the Armed Forces Forum since we last reported to the full council in April 2016. Last year we amended the council's constitution to formalise our commitment to the Armed Forces community so it is actually hardwired, if you like, into the council's DNA. We achieved the silver, the silver award in 2016 from the MOD's Employer Recognition Scheme, which recognises the employers who support ex-service personnel and their organisation and acts as advocates for the armed forces community. We were very close to receiving the gold award in July 2017. If you can believe what was said, uh, they were. Uh, there were 31 applicants, and we were, we, we were 31st. <laughs> uh, so I think that's it. I don't, I don't, that's, it. That's, uh, that's the feedback that we got. However, uh, not to be too despondent, we were very, very close, and it was a good application, uh, but we were um, outgunned, if you like, by Summoned Hospital Trust. <laughs> I just have to get that one. Okay. And so we're going to resubmit an application um, this year. And I'm, I'm confident, I think I'm quite confident, uh, as is Paul Balls here sitting here, uh, that we, we, uh, we will be successful. And I'm pleased to, to announce also that Southdays and Homes received a silver award in 2017 with our, with our support. We've upgraded the, the website, and this has been regarded by uh, Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Black, who is the Army, uh, Army Liaison Lead within the region, that is one of the best in the Northern region. So that's another plus for our website. We've continued to develop our outreach worker service. As you know, we employ a X service, service there, uh, but it's more than this time. Um, Kyle, Kyle left us just, uh, just before uh, uh, Christmas. We now have uh, Nicole Atkinson, who is ex, um, ex military police, and she's now working for us as an outreach worker. Uh, she's operating from the home by the service. We established what we call a nappy break, that's a drop in service for ex service personnel. <coughs> uh, we've advertised on post shelters, post and leaflets and banners. Uh, and mm -hmm. to, in order to promote the service initially. And we're also planning an open day event for the service in March to maximise the number of ex service personnel attending. We secured £20,000 from the MOD to complete a, a, a project which was promoting employment of veterans and reservists in the, in the borough. And we're looking further ahead to developing a residential project for ex-service personnel. This is along the South Times and Homes, and that is to commence. We, we have got a schedule for Easter this year. And again, this is with the help of further funds, a successful bid that we made from the MOD of £17,000. And we will be also offering employment opportunities for the caretaker for ex -service, and ex-service a, per, a person to take up that take up that course. We've also successfully bid for fourteen thousand pounds funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund. And this is for work with schools and communities to commemorate the end of World War One in twenty eighteen. So this work is on board and it will be showcased in the weekly note to the commemoration of World War One in November twenty eighteen. And as members will be aware, we will be having a commemoration event on November the 11th of this, of this year. And I'm also pleased to announce that the Army Board have approved our bid to the Army Compression External Places Program, whereby a senior Army officer, now uh, that's a captain, a captain level on the board, uh, spends a 6 to 12 months of visit in the council. We are the only local authority that they are working with. The local authority certainly did not 
certainly in the northeast, and to my knowledge, in the whole of the country. And uh, we, we interviewed the, um, the potential candidate, he's a major in the Royal Artillery, and uh, I think he's looking, if the army go ahead with the replacement, um, we will be very pleased to, to, uh, to, um, to learn from this, from this major, uh, and also, of course, he will learn from us. On how we on different organizing different organizations, and so we're continuing to look at all ways we can assist, assist servicemen find employment when leaving the forces and working towards producing a guaranteed interview scheme for ex-service personnel who fulfill, fulfill criteria criteria for posts. I think um, I did mention to members in another place that um, sometimes at homes are also um, introducing a scheme whereby service personnel who are about to leave the armed forces get some training from their, from, from, their, from some things like homes in order to ease them back into a civilian, civilian life. Because there's one thing that I've learned uh, doing this particular role is that Speaking to ex returning personnel, uh, service personnel, they find it very, very difficult to get themselves established in the uh, into um, <coughs> into civilian life. And of course, we have someone. I'm looking at Paul Scott in there. We have someone uh, working in Paul's department, uh, Ross, who's uh, ex ex service and who's uh, doing a, a grand job by by all accounts. So we're doing our bit. And I think that, um, I think, uh, by the way, this demonstrates our commitment to supporting the armed forces community and the leadership we are providing for all organisations in the borough of the Dubai Because don't forget, the, community, the government isn't only just us. It's the NHS. It is other organisations, other um, welfare organisations within, within the borough, which, yeah, which sat well, they had a signing agreement with Jimmy, and Councilor Jimmy Shull was the mayor at the time, and uh, you know, there was a crew full of people in here uh, who did sign that covenant. And what we need to do is re reinvent that to try and bring more people uh, and more organisations on board. And we, and we, as a council, we have invested a lot of time and effort into this, and we've invested a lot of officer time and commitment. And I want to put on record. Uh, Madam Mayor, you know, the work that uh, Paul Bordesira has done in this particular, in this particular role, on top of the other roles that he has. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I mentioned to the Councillor Reed Martin about uh, something for Paul Bordesira to do, he said, how many Paul Bordesira do you have with him? <laughs> well, he got the one, but uh, just, uh, he obviously was have to use his time. So I'd like to move that report, uh, Madam Mayor, to uh, outline the work that we have been doing in the Armed Forces Forum, and we'll continue to do. Thank, Thank you, Madam Mayor. Is that seconded? Seconded. Are there any questions, or does any member wish to speak to the report? No. Uh, is the motion agreed? Agreed. The next business is to receive questions under Procedure Rule 8. No questions have been received under this rule. The next business is to deal with the petition the Council has received to consider extending the current resident permit parking scheme currently in operation in the neighbouring streets, Caroline Street and Railway Street, to include Edith Street. The, pish, the petition has 11 signatories. We will not debate the petition today. In accordance with standing orders, I propose that the petition stand referred to the appropriate officer for further consideration. Is that seconded? Agreed. Is that agreed? agreed? The next business is to receive motions under Procedure Rule 10. No motions have been received under this rule. That concludes the business for today's meeting. Thank you for your attendance.